While the uniformed attendants of Mariner's Waxworks were ushering the last stragglers through the great glass-panelled double doors, the manager sat in his office interviewing Raymond Hewson. The manager was a youngish man, stout, blonde, and of medium height. He wore his clothes well, and contrived to look extremely smart without appearing overdressed. Raymond Hewson looked neither. His clothes, which had been good when new, and which were still carefully brushed and pressed, were beginning to show signs of their owner's losing battle with the world. He was a small, spare, pale man, with lank, errant brown hair, and although he spoke plausibly and even forcibly, he had the defensive and somewhat furtive air of a man who was used to rebuffs. He looked what he was, a man gifted somewhat above the ordinary, who was a failure through his lack of self-assertion. The manager was speaking. There is nothing new in your request, he said. In fact, we refuse it to different people, mostly young bloods who have tried to make bets about three times a week. We have nothing to gain and something to lose by letting people spend the night in our murderous den. If I allowed it and some young idiot lost his senses, what would be my position? But your being a journalist somewhat alters the case. Hewson smiled. I suppose you mean that journalists have no senses to lose. <laughs> no, no, laughed the manager. But one imagines them to be responsible people. Besides, here we have something to gain. Publicity and advertisement. Exactly, said Hewson. And there I, I thought we might come to terms. The manager laughed again. Oh, he exclaimed. I know what's coming. You want to be paid twice, do you? It used to be said years ago that Madame Two Swords would give a man a hundred pounds for sleeping alone in the Chamber of Horrors. I hope you don't think that we have made any such offer. Um, what is your paper, Mr. Hewson? I am freelancing at present, Hewson confessed, working on space for several papers. However, I should find no difficulty in getting the story printed. The Morning Echo would use it like a shot. A night with mariners, murderers. No life paper could turn it down. The manager rubbed his chin. Ah, and how do you propose to treat it? I shall make it gruesome, of course. Gruesome with just a saving touch of humour. The other nodded and offered Hewson his cigarette case. Very well, Mr. Hewson, he said. Get your story printed in the morning echo, and there will be a five-pound note waiting for you here when you care to come and call for it. But first of all, it's no small ordeal that you're proposing to undertake. I'd like to be quite sure about you, and I'd like you to be quite sure about yourself. I own I shouldn't care to take it on. I've seen those figures dressed and undressed. I know all about the process of their manufacture. I can walk about in company downstairs as unmoved as if I were walking among so many skittles, but... I should hate having to sleep down there alone among them. Why? asked Hewson. I don't know. There isn't any reason. I don't believe in ghosts. If I did, I should expect them to haunt the scene of their crimes or the spot where their bodies were laid instead of a cellar which happens to contain their waxwork effigy. It's just that I couldn't sit alone among them all night, with their seeming to stare at me in the way they do. After all, they represent the lowest and most appalling types of humanity, and although I would not own it publicly, the people who come to see them are not generally charged with the very highest motives. The whole atmosphere of the place is unpleasant, and if you are susceptible to atmosphere, I warn you that you are in for a very uncomfortable night. Hewson had known that from the moment when the idea had first occurred to him. His soul sickened at the prospect, even while he smiled casually upon the manager. But he had a wife and family to keep, and for the past month he had been living on paragraphs, eked out by his rapidly dwindling store of savings. Here was a chance not to be missed. The price of a special story in the morning echo, with a five-pound note to add to it. It meant comparative wealth and luxury for a week, and freedom from the worst anxieties for a fortnight. Besides, if he wrote the story well, it might lead to an offer of regular employment. The way of transgressors and newspaper men is hard, 
he said. I have already promised myself an uncomfortable night, because your murderous den is obviously not fitted up as an hotel bedroom, but I don't think your waxworks will worry me much. You're not superstitious? <laughs> not a bit, Houston laughed. But you're a journalist. You must have a strong imagination. The news editors for whom I've worked have always complained that I haven't any. Plain facts are not considered sufficient in our trade, and the papers don't like offering their readers unbuttered bread. The manager smiled and rose. Right, he said. I think the last of the people have gone. Wait a moment, I'll give orders for the figures downstairs not to be draped, and let the night people know that you'll be here. Then I'll take you down and show you around. He picked up the receiver of a house telephone, spoke into it, and presently replaced it. One condition I am afraid I must impose on you, he remarked. I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare down in the murderer's den this evening. I don't know who gave the alarm, but whoever it was, it was a false one. Fortunately, there were very few people down there at the time, or there might have been a panic. And now, if you're ready, we'll make a move. Hewson followed the manager through half a dozen rooms where attendants were busy shrouding the kings and queens of England, the generals and prominent statesmen of this and other generations, all the mixed herd of humanity whose fame or notoriety had rendered them eligible for this kind of immortality. The manager stopped once and spoke to a man in uniform, saying something about an armchair in the murderer's den. It's the best we can do for you, I am afraid, he said to Hewson. I hope you'll be able to get some sleep. He led the way through an open barrier and down ill-lit stone stairs which conveyed a sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon. In a passage at the bottom were a few preliminary horrors, such as relics of the Inquisition, a rack taken from a medieval castle, branding irons, thumbscrews, and other mementos of man's one-time cruelty to man. Beyond the passage was the murderous den. It was a room of irregular shape with a vaulted roof, and dimly lit by electric lights burning behind inverted bowls of frosted glass. It was, by design, an eerie and uncomfortable chamber. A chamber whose atmosphere invited its visitors to speak in whispers. There was something of the air of a chapel about it, but a chapel no longer devoted to the practice of piety and given over now for base and impious worship. The waxwork murderers stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Seeing them elsewhere and without knowing whom they represented, one would have thought them a dull-looking crew, chiefly remarkable for the shabbiness of their clothes, and as evidence of the changes of fashion even among the unfashionable. Recent notorieties rubbed dusty shoulders with the old favourites, Thurtell, the murderer of Weir, stood as if frozen in the act of making a shop-window gesture to young Bywaters. There was Lefroy, the poor half-baked little snob who killed for gain so that he might ape the gentleman. Within five yards of him sat Mrs. Thompson, that erotic romanticist, hanged to propitiate British middle-class matronhood. Charles Peace, the only member of that vile company, who looked uncompromisingly and entirely evil, sneered across a gangway at Norman Thome. Brown and Kennedy, the two most recent additions, stood between Mrs. Dyer and Patrick Mahon. The manager, walking around with Hewson, pointed out several of the more interesting of these unholy notabilities. That's Crippin. I expect you recognise him, insignificant little beast who looks as if he couldn't tread on a worm. That's Armstrong. Looks like a decent, harmless country gentleman, doesn't he? There's old Vakwe. You can't miss him because of his beard. And of course this... Who's that? Hewson interrupted in a whisper, pointing. Oh, I was coming to him, said the manager in a light undertone. Come and have a good look at him. This is our star turn. He's the only one of the bunch that hasn't been hanged. The figure, which Hewson had indicated, was that of a small, slight man, not much more than five feet in height. It wore little waxed moustaches, large spectacles, and a caped coat. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded Hewson of a stage caricature. He could not have said precisely why the mild-looking face seemed to him so repellent, but he had already recoiled a step, and even in the manager's company it cost him an effort to look again. But who is he? he asked, 
That, said the manager, is Dr. Bordet. Hewson shook his head doubtfully. I think I've heard the name, he said, but I forget in connection with what. The manager smiled. You'd remember better if you were a Frenchman, he said. For some long while that man was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of throat cutting by night when the fit was on him. He killed for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him to kill, and always in the same way, with a razor. After his last crime he left a clue behind him which set the police upon his track. One clue led to another, and before very long they knew that they were on the track of the Parisian equivalent of our Jack the Ripper, and had enough evidence to send him to the madhouse or the guillotine on a dozen capital charges. But even then our friend here was too clever for them. When he realised that the toils were closing about him, he mysteriously disappeared, and ever since the police of every civilised country have been looking for him. There is no doubt that he managed to make away with himself, and by some means which has prevented his body coming to light. One or two crimes of a similar nature have taken place since his disappearance, but he is believed almost for certain to be dead, and the experts believe these recrudescences to be the work of an imitator. It's queer, isn't it, how every notorious murderer has imitators? Hewson shuddered and fidgeted with his feet. I don't like him at all, he confessed. Ugh, what eyes he's got. Yes, this figure's a little masterpiece. You find the eyes bite into you? Well, that's excellent realism, then, for Baudet practised mesmerism and was supposed to mesmerise his victims before dispatching them. Indeed, had he not done so, it is impossible to see how so small a man could have done his ghastly work. There were never any signs of a struggle. I thought I saw him move, said Hewson, with a catch in his voice. You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect. You shan't be locked in. You can come upstairs when you've had enough of it. There are watchmen on the premises, so you'll find company. Don't be alarmed if you hear them moving about. I'm sorry I can't give you any more light, because all the lights are on. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as gloomy as possible. And now I think you had better return with me to the office and have a tot of whiskey before beginning your night's vigil. The member of the night staff who placed the armchair for Hewson was inclined to be facetious. Where will you have it, sir? he asked, grinning. Just here, so you can have a little talk with Crippin when you're tired of sitting still. Or there's old Mother Dyer over there, making eyes and looking as if she could do with a bit of company. Say where, sir. Hewson smiled. The man's chaff pleased him, if only because, for the moment at least, it lent the proceedings a much-desired air of the commonplace. I'll place it myself, thanks, he said. I'll find out where the draughts come from first. You won't find any down here. Well, good night, sir. I'm upstairs if you want me. Don't let them sneak up behind you and touch your neck with their cold and clammy hands. And you look out for that old Mrs. Dyer. I believe she's taken a fancy to you. Hewson laughed and wished the man good night. It was easier than he had expected. He wheeled the armchair, a heavy one, upholstered in plush, a little way down the central gangway, and deliberately turned it so that its back was towards the effigy of Dr. Bordet. For some undefined reason, he liked Dr. Bordet a great deal less than his companions. Busying himself with arranging the chair, he was almost light-hearted. But when the attendant's footfalls had died away, and a deep hush stole over the chamber, he realised that he had no slight ordeal before him. The dim, unwavering light fell on the rows of figures which were so uncannily like human beings that the silence and the stillness seemed unnatural and even ghastly. He missed the sound of breathing, the rustling of clothes, the hundred and one minute noises one hears when even the deepest silence has fallen upon a crowd. But the air was as stagnant as water at the bottom of a standing pond. There was not a breath in the chamber to stir a curtain, or rustle a hanging drapery, or start a shadow. His own shadow, moving in response to a shifted arm or leg, was all that could be coaxed into motion. All was still to the gaze and silent to the ear, 
It must be like this at the bottom of the sea, he thought, and wondered how to work the phrase into his story on the morrow. He faced the sinister figures boldly enough. They were only waxworks. So long as he let that thought dominate all others, he promised himself that all would be well. It did not, however, save him long from the discomfort occasioned by the waxen stare of Dr. Bordet, which he knew was directed upon him from behind. The eyes of the little Frenchman's effigy haunted and tormented him, and he itched with the desire to turn and look. Come, he thought. My nerves have started already. If I turn and look at that dressed-up dummy, it will be an admission of funk. And then another voice in his brain spoke to him. It's because you're afraid that you won't turn and look at him. The two voices quarrelled silently for a moment or two, and at last Hewson slewed his chair round a little and looked behind him. Among the many figures standing in stiff, unnatural poses, the effigy of the dreadful little doctor stood out with a queer prominence. Perhaps because a steady beam of light beat straight down upon it, Hewson flinched before the parody of mildness which some fiendishly skilled craftsman had managed to convey in wax, met the eyes for one agonised second, and turned again to face the other direction. "'He's only a waxwork like the rest of you,' Hewson muttered defiantly. "'You're all only waxworks.' "'They were only waxworks, yes,' But waxworks don't move. Not that he had seen the least movement anywhere, but it struck him that in the moment or two while he had looked behind him, there had been the least subtle change in the grouping of the figures in front. Crippin, for instance, seemed to have turned at least one degree to the left. Or, thought Hewson, perhaps the illusion was due to the fact that he had not slewed his chair back into its exact original position. And there were Field and Grey, too. Surely one of them had moved his hands. Hewson held his breath for a moment, and then drew his courage back to him as a man lifts a weight. He remembered the words of more than one news editor and laughed savagely to himself. And they tell me I've got no imagination, he said beneath his breath. He took a notebook from his pocket and wrote quickly. Mem, deftly silence and unearthly stillness of figures, like being bottom of sea, hypnotic eyes of Dr. Bordet. Figures seem to move when not being watched. He closed the book suddenly over his fingers and looked round quickly and awfully over his right shoulder. He had neither seen nor heard a movement, but it was as if some sixth sense had made him aware of one. He looked straight into the vapid countenance of Lefroy, which smiled vacantly back as if to say, It wasn't I. Of course it wasn't he, or any of them. It was his own nerves. Or was it? Hadn't Crippin moved again during that moment when his attention was directed elsewhere? You couldn't trust that little man. Once you took your eyes off him, he took advantage of it to shift his position. That's what they were all doing, if he only knew it, he told himself, and half rose out of his chair. This was not quite good enough. He was going. He wasn't going to spend the night with a lot of waxworks which moved while he wasn't looking. Hewson sat down again. This was very cowardly and very absurd. They were only waxworks, and they couldn't move. Let him hold that thought, and all would yet be well. Then why all that silent unrest about him? A subtle something in the air which did not quite break the silence and happened, whichever way he looked, just beyond the boundaries of his vision. He swung round quickly to encounter the mild but baleful stare of Dr. Bordet. Then, without warning, he jerked his head back to stare straight at Crippen. Ha! He'd nearly caught Crippen that time. You'd better be careful, Crippen, and all the rest of you. If I do see one of you move, I'll smash you to pieces. Do you hear? He ought to go, he told himself. Already he had experienced enough to write his story. Or ten stories, for the matter of that. Well then, why not go? The morning echo would be none the wiser as to how long he had stayed. Nor would it care so long as his story was a good one. Yes, but 
That night watchman upstairs would chaff him, and the manager, one never knew, perhaps the manager would quibble over that five-pound note which he needed so badly. He wondered if Rose were asleep, or if she were lying awake and thinking of him. She'd laugh when he told her that he had imagined. This was a little too much. It was bad enough that the waxwork effigies of murderers should move when they weren't being watched, but it was intolerable that they should breathe. Somebody was breathing. Or was it his own breath which sounded to him as if it came from a distance? He sat rigid, listening and straining, until he exhaled with a long sigh. His own breath, after all, or, if not, something had divined that he was listening and had ceased breathing simultaneously. Hewson jerked his head swiftly around and looked all about him out of haggard and haunted eyes. Everywhere his gaze encountered the vacant waxen faces, and everywhere he felt that by just some least fraction of a second had he missed seeing a movement of hand or foot, a silent opening or compression of lips, a flicker of eyelids, a look of human intelligence now smoothed out. They were like naughty children in a class, whispering, fidgeting and laughing behind their teacher's back but blandly innocent when his gaze was turned upon them. This would not do, this distinctly would not do. He must clutch at something, grip with his mind upon something which belonged essentially to the workaday world, to the daylight London streets. He was Raymond Hewson, an unsuccessful journalist, a living and breathing man, and these figures grouped around him were only dummies, so they could neither move nor whisper. What did it matter if they were supposed to be lifelike effigies of murderers? They were only made of wax and sawdust, and stood there for the entertainment of morbid sightseers and orange-shucking trippers. That was better. Now, what was that funny story which somebody had told him in the Falstaff yesterday? He recalled part of it, but not all, for the gaze of Dr. Bordet urged, challenged, and finally compelled him to turn. Hewson half-turned and then swung his chair so as to bring him face to face with the wearer of those dreadful hypnotic eyes. His own eyes were dilated and his mouth, at first set in a grin of terror, lifted at the corners in a snarl. Then Hewson spoke and woke a hundred sinister echoes. You moved, damn you, he cried. Yes, you did, damn you, I saw you. Then he sat quite still, staring straight before him, like a man found frozen in the Arctic snows. Dr. Bordet's movements were leisurely. He stepped off his pedestal with the mincing care of a lady alighting from a bus. The platform stood about two feet from the ground, and above the edge of it a plush-covered rope hung in arc-like curves. Dr. Bordet lifted up the rope until it formed an arch for him to pass under, stepped off the platform and sat down on the edge facing Hewson. Then he nodded and smiled and said, Good evening. I need hardly tell you, he continued in perfect English in which was traceable only the least foreign accent. That not until I overheard the conversation between you and the worthy manager of this establishment did I suspect that I should have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. You cannot move or speak without my bidding, but you can hear me perfectly well. Something tells me that you are, shall I say, nervous. My dear sir, have no illusions. I am not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Bordet himself. He paused, coughed, and shifted his legs. Pardon me, he resumed, but I am a little stiff, and let me explain. Circumstances with which I need not fatigue you have made it desirable that I should live in England. I was close to this building this evening when I saw a policeman regarding me, I thought too curiously. 
I guessed that he intended to follow and perhaps ask me embarrassing questions, so I mingled with the crowd and came in here. An extra coin brought my admission to the chamber in which we now meet, and an inspiration showed me a certain means of escape. I raised a cry of fire, and when all the fools had rushed to the stairs, I stripped my effigy of the caped coat, which you behold me wearing, donned it, hid my effigy under the platform at the back, and took its place on the pedestal. I own that I have since spent a very fatiguing evening, but fortunately I was not always being watched, and had opportunities to draw an occasional deep breath, and ease the rigidity of my pose. One small boy screamed and exclaimed that he saw me moving. I understood that he was supposed to be whipped and put straight to bed on his return home, and I can only hope that the threat has been executed to the letter. The manager's description of me, which I had the embarrassment of being compelled to overhear, was biased but not altogether inaccurate. Clearly I am not dead, although it is as well that the world thinks otherwise. His account of my hobby, which I have indulged for years, although through necessity less frequently of light, was in the main true, although not intelligently expressed. The world is divided between collectors and non-collectors. With the non-collectors we are not concerned. The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes, from money to cigarette cards, from moths to matchboxes. I collect throats. He paused again and regarded Hewson's throat with interest, mingled with disfavour. I am obliged to the chance which brought us together tonight, he continued, and perhaps it would seem ungrateful to complain from motives of personal safety my activities have been somewhat curtailed of late years, and I am glad of this opportunity of gratifying my somewhat unusual whim, but you have a skinny neck, sir, if you will overlook a personal remark. I should never have selected you from choice. I like men with thick necks. Thick red necks. He fumbled in an inside pocket and took out something which he tested against a wet forefinger and then proceeded to pass gently to and fro across the palm of his left hand. This is a little French razor, he remarked blandly. They are not much used in England, but perhaps you know them. One strops them on wood. The blade, you will observe, is very narrow. They do not cut very deep, but deep enough. In just one little moment you shall see for yourself. I shall ask you the little civil question of all the polite barbers. Does the razor suit you, sir? He rose up, a diminutive but menacing figure of evil, and approached Hewson with the silent, furtive step of a hunting panther. You will have the goodness, he said, to raise your chin a little. Thank you, and a little more, just a little more. Ah, thank you. Merci, monsieur. Ah, merci, merci. Over one end of the chamber was a thick skylight of frosted glass, which, by day, let in a few sickly and filtered rays from the floor above. After sunrise, these began to mingle with the subdued light from the electric bulbs, and this mingled illumination added a certain ghastliness to a scene which needed no additional touch of horror. The waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places, waiting to be admired or execrated by the crowds, who would presently wander fearfully among them. In their midst, in the centre gangway, Hewson sat still, leaning far back in his armchair, 
His chin was up-tilted as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber, and although there was not a scratch upon his throat, nor anywhere upon his body, he was cold and dead. His previous employers were wrong in having credited him with no imagination. Dr. Bordet, on his pedestal, watched the dead man unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion. But then, after all, he was only a waxwork. Today's story was The Waxwork by A. M. Burridge It was read by Jasper Lestrange If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>